as the uh, blunt uh, traumatic brain injuries. Uh, it's less than uh, 10%, uh, although it's the fourth leading cause of mortality under age of 45. Um, Non-missile objects represent a rare pathology. Uh, male affected more than female. Uh, it, those patients has a higher risk of infection in compared to the blunt uh, traumatic brain injury patients. Um, and there will be a damage uh, to everything inside the skull. It can be the blood, ves blood vessels, uh, uh, brain tissues, it can get all kinds of infection, meningitis, encephalitis, uh, and brain abscesses. Uh, we had many cases um, uh, in Jezan of penetrating head injury um, because of uh, our location. We are on the border, so we, we unfortunately, we get to manage a couple of those, uh, especially gun. Uh, gunshot injury patients. Uh, there are many varieties. You can get nails, knives, gunshots, um, pencils, anything can can penetrate the, the skull. Um, and there are many factors uh, determine the extent of the injury, which is really important to know and recognize because that will, will um, will influence your uh, clinical decision on, on management as well as the overall prognosis. Uh, low felicity projectile, um, it has a low kinetic energy, it has less uh, shock waves uh, and less damage to the brain in compared to high felicity projectile like a gunshot injury. Natural projectile um, matter, um, especially the, the size of it, the content um, of it, uh, point of entry and angle of projectile, and, and finally, the characteristic of the intervening tissues. Um, does, it, does it land it just underneath the skin? Does it penetrate the skull? Um, did it involve more than one loop? Did it cross the midline? and involve the ventricles or the uh, nasal sinuses. <clears throat> so this is all will play a role in your clinical decision on, on, decision, on, on, on management as well as overall outcomes. And finally, the anatomic and neurovascular st structure of the passage as, as, as I just mentioned. So the damage can happen um, uh, because of the primary injuries, either from direct impact, soft tissue injury, you can get bone fractures, and you can <clears throat> get cerebral injury in the bath. You can get cobe and counter cobe from missile impact, um, the same with uh, traumatic brain injury. Uh, you add more here, you can get, get more severe shock waves and, and temporary cavity formations, which is really um, the, the, the unique pathophysiology of the uh, missile uh, penetrating and injury, as I will explain later. Um, unfortunately, there's no, not much we can do for the primary, primary injury. Uh, the damage already happened, but we, what we would try to prevent and manage is the secondary injury. Uh, the edema, ischemia, the, the hemorrhage, which is causing mass effect, uh, or the high ICP. So this is what we are trying to control uh, and prevent uh, in managing those patients. Uh, usually the damage in missile penetrating injuries, specifically with, with the gunshot, the damage usually it's beyond the bullet tract uh, because of the shock waves and the cavity formation you, you had. Um, it does affect um, um, uh, a large part of the brain uh, as well as uh, causing uh, hemorrhage, 
uh, and edema. Uh, ER management, how do we manage um, uh, those patients? Um, as you all know, uh, it's like any trauma case. You're gonna do your primary surface and stabilize your patients by doing your um, ABCs. You're gonna inspect uh, you, your patient's wound. Uh, you wanna determine where is the entry and exit point. You wanna uh, de determine your G patient GCS um, as well as uh, the clinical indication of resident intracranial pressures. Uh, you wanna check the pupil. You wanna um, um, look for lateral lateralizing sign. Uh, you wanna check the Cushing triad. Look if the patient is uh, bradycardic or hypertensive. Uh, and you have try to do that. If patient con condition is, is a stable, try to do that of sedation. Um, especially if the patient doesn't have um, sign of high intracranial pressure. Uh, usually those patient has isolated penetrating head injury to the head most of them, they don't have any issue with ventilation. So you can stop their, their sedation and get proper GCS um, assessment because it has a major role in, in overall prognosis and your clinical judgment. Uh, complete your examination of other organ system. You don't wanna miss any other uh, penetrating injuries in any other parts of the, of the body. As expected, you wanna do your detailed medical histories, uh, patient medications, you wanna do your basic blood work, uh, check the coagulation bro uh, profile and um, do type and cross match and prepare some blood. Then you wanna move your patient for images. During that, or, or, or I mean, in fact, from the first time you see your patient, and you, if you are suspect, if you are suspecting high intracranial pressure, you're gonna manage that throughout your uh, assessment, moving patient to the um, to the um, CT scan, uh, and either to the operating room or to the intensive care unit, uh, depending depending on the uh, on the images. Uh, so you have to you have to keep that in your mind if you finish your. Um, your um, um, clinical assessment, you, you wanna put the patient back on sedation um, to help with, with controlling I, uh, ICB with all other measures uh, you guys know. As we mentioned, those patients has a higher risk of infection, uh, especially uh, if the paranasal sinuses is penetrated uh, or the tract or the pullet passing the ventricles, or if you have CSF leak. Um, and that's why a meticulous debridement is, is really important on those patients. Uh, with the era of antibiotic, uh, this risk drops significantly to be around 10%. 10, 10%. Um, more common organism is the staph aureus. Until now, we don't have really good evidence which antibiotic we should start and how, um, how broad we should be in, in terms of, of uh, covering uh, with antibiotics. Uh, but all those patients, I do start them on antibiotics. Um, um, and it's, it's basically our clinical judgment. Um, we start either with a simple um, um, antibiotic coverage to broad spectrum, include uh, ciftriaxone, FANCO, um, and metronidazole if the patient is high risk, if the baronized sinus is penetrated, if there is a CSF leak. And as I said, this is all clinical judgment. We don't have really good evidence, but for sure antibiotic 
coverage should be uh, should be started. Uh, seizure is is more common uh, in compared to the close traumatic brain injury. Around 30 to 50 percent of patients develop seizure, and we are uh, applying the Brain Trauma Foundation recommendation um, um, in in those patients in terms of uh, seizure prophylaxis. I give them only uh, a week uh, unless patient developed seizure, uh, then uh, they should they should be treated accordingly. You start with uh, CT scan for uh, all those patients. And if the trajectory near uh, any major blood vessel, and that includes sylphian fissure, uh, subraclinoid uh, carotid, caferna sinus, um, uh, close to the vertebrobasilar around the um, foramen magnum, or major dural uh, venous sinuses, I do CT and you. And CT phenogram. It depends on the um, on the either the venous or the um, artery injury is suspected. Um, rarely, sometimes we need to do DSA. Um, unusual pathology is either dissection, occlusion, um, uh, pseudoaneurysm, or carotid carotid cavernous fistula, and you don't want to. Uh, miss those kind of the pathology because uh, re-rupture rate is, is really high in those patients and uh, definitely that will increase their uh, mor morbidity and mortality. And we will, I will show you a couple of cases uh, later. I believe the surgical treatment should be done in OR setting, unless really you are doing minor uh, wound closure. And you have, uh, and if you decided to do it um, uh, in the ER for whatever reason, it should be um, done very well. Uh, you should, uh, should be done under complete sterilization as if you are in the operating room. Um, please don't attempt to remove visible foreign body in the in the ER, I think that's that's that can be dangerous. Usually, your goal is surgical debridement and removal of defital um, of uh, defatalized tissue, um, removal of uh, mass lesion such uh, a hematoma causing mass effect. Um, and we don't attempt to remove any deep retained fragment in fatal area of the brain because definitely you are going to cause more damage than benefit. As a part of your sur surgical management, sometime we, um, if the patient has a severe um, um, brain edema or you are anticipating severe brain, um, uh, if the patient has severe brain edema, sometimes we do decompressive craniectomy at the same time. Uh, rarely we use an EVD uh, to help with ICB as well as the ICB, manage, uh, as the ICB measurement and management. Close follow-up is really mandatory for infection and we have many patients presented with delay infection. Uh, CCF leak, as well as the vascular uh, pseudoaneurysm uh, or fistula. Let us start with stab wound. Um, maybe we should start with um, with one of the resident. Um, we'll start with a junior resident, Ahmed. So this is a, a two and a half years old girl. Um, she fell into a pencil, as you can see, and she came in irritable with a GCS of 14. And this is her CT scan.
So maybe R2, R3 kind of live in. I want to know how they could manage uh, these patients in the ER. Any one of the uh, guys would like to take the case? Just raise a hand. I will give you the uh, mic. Yes, this is a clearly penetrating head injury in missile involving the posterior fossa for this pediatric patient. I don't see uh, there is hemorrhage around the uh, the, the foreign body. Uh, I did not pick the uh, ventricular system whether there is hydrocephalus or not. No hydro. Yeah, uh, sh sure. So um, on the CT scan, you are you're coming. I mean, there is no hydro. Yes, it's one. There is. Um, you can see the pronin body is penetrating the, the skull and, and landed on the left cerebellum. I, I think this is only just artifact. I don't. I don't believe there is actual um, significant bleeding at, at least. Uh, I'm really sorry because the, the the child was moving, so there is an artifact. But there is really important things you should comment on uh, on the CT scan. Sinus, uh, there is, I cannot uh, figure out if there is any sinus injury or the involvement without uh, contrasted imaging. But it's around the, uh, uh, there is around the, uh, it is around the uh, sinuses without the circum, uh, the, uh, actually yeah. the big is quite. Uh, e excellent. So you want to know how's this object related to the sinus? Because that's really important in your management. Um, um, in preparing your patient and, and, and on the decision if to remove these things or leave it. Um, anatomically, if you're, if you're looking at this child's skull, I mean, it looks like anatomically just below the transferred sinus. Uh, and in, in the image also, it looks like just below the transferred sinus. Um, I mean, if it's not going through it, I wouldn't do CT phenogram. I don't think you need that. On, on regular CT, you can tell what is the sinus. Um, not on this one, although. Okay, that's really critical and important. What's the other thing you should comment on or you should look at, even if it's not projectile when, well in the this, in this CT? Uh, looking for coup, counter coup, and uh, for fractures around this car. Yeah, do you, do you expect to cope and counter cope and this kind of uh, mechanism? No, no. Excellent. So usually in, in high speed, in uh, um, either either in gunshot or I mean in, in high speed um, 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 uh, traffic accident. Um, the the other thing is, is, which is really important, anyone want to comment on that? Yeah, whenever you have a pathology um, on, the, on the posterior fossa, you want to look at the fourth ventricle. If the it's the, on the fourth ventricle, if it's deviated or not, uh, because you want to know if, you know, the posterior fossa is not forgivable. It's not like a supratentorial pathology. If there is ongoing mass effect or edema, you, you want to pick, pick, that, pick that up really early. So you look at the, the fourth ventricle, if it's compressed, if it's in the middle, yes, here it's, it's not compressed, it's in the middle. And then you, you want to look at the foramen of magnum, which is, as I mentioned, it's not clear here. Then I look if there is, if the tonsil is down, if the foramen magnum is crowded, because those patients, you know, I mean, could, they could herniate or, at, at or under rest at, at any time. Less likely in this patient by VCA of 14, but it's in general, Whenever you have a pathology in the, on the posterior fossa, you have to comment on the fourth ventricle as well as a foramen magna. Um, good, so that's a that's, that's good description of the CT. So what do you want to do with this lovely girl? No. You, are in, you are now with her. What, how do you want to proceed? Sorry. Uh, after assessment of the patient and uh, stabilizing her with the ABC, would like to admit her in the highly monitored uh, uh, unit, plus taking her to uh, emergency OR uh, after stabilization and uh, taking out the uh, 
foreign body after uh, wide exposure of the posterior fossa and making sure that there is no involvement of the sciences. Excellent. Yeah, so the, 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 the principal, um, sorry, I don't have it in this one. So uh, before we go, uh, uh, for the junior resident, I, I think you guys, you should know the modified Glasgow Coma Scale for infants and children. Always I have difficulty with my resident and, and specialist in, in giving me a GCA score for a child. So that's really important and that's, that's what help you throughout your residency. So you wanna do a wide exposure. <laughs> If you believe the uh, um, the foreign body is not going to the sinus, which is in this case, please try to avoid to expose the sinus. I mean, you can do it, and it, I mean, it's 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 really safe, and and you should have the skills to do that, but you don't have to do it. Okay, um, do your wide exposure. You're gonna do a reasonably wide craniotomy around the. Um, uh, around the um, the pencil, so you are not gonna just hold the pencil. You wanna do your skin incision, do your craniotomy, open the dura. Um, this is all around the pencil, and then after that, personally, uh, I mean, you have two options: either just gently pulling it out and um, um, and um, uh, look into the uh, into the cavity and be sure there's no active bleeding, no uh, hematoma, or just follow the the pencil uh, deep enough to be sure um, there is no um, hematoma um, from from pulling the pencil, and then you you cl close uh, uh, as usual. Uh, this is uh, another case. Um, um, I mean, it's close to that one. Uh, it's a knife injury, and you can see it's close enough to the superior sagittal sinus. Um, so in those patients, you have to do um, at least CT venogram um, uh, to be certain that the knife is not involving the sinus. And if it's if it does, then your preparation preparation to the surgery is completely different uh, in terms of uh, getting enough blood in the room, um, uh, exposing both side and sinus, uh, and and be prepared uh, to repair it if if needed. Um, so this is um, this is another patient. Um, I mean the ER physician. I don't know why he did that one, but uh, this is in to me by a friend, um, they tried to remove uh, the knife in the ER. And there was a beast uh, left behind. Um, so he was taking to the OR um, and done in the right way. So please, the, the message from, from this is uh, don't remove it in the ER. It should be done uh, under control uh, sitting in the operating room. Um, and this is another case. So surgically exposure is really critical. This is uh, another case. So as I mentioned, in your exposure, try to have a really a wide exposure. Um, you know, if you have an extensive bleeding, then you will be able to control it easily, as you can see in this picture. This is all couple of cases. So the other kind of penetrating head injury is uh, nail guns. I haven't seen any case here in Saudi. It's, it's common in Western country. Um, as you all know, those nail guns powered by exclusive cartridge or compressed air, they are pretty powerful, as high as 8.5 bar, which con could penetrate even concrete. Um, a speed as high as uh, 400 meter per second. It's basically like a, a missile, a gunshot uh, injury, uh, which can be really uh, bad. Um, uh, this is this case I saw in my residency. This 54 years old patient self-inflicted with uh, with this bar drill. Uh, he he got two um, 
uh, nail guns, as you can see, uh, which was uh, removed and he has a reasonable outcome. Um, so what, what do you think we should do with this one? Um, maybe one of the senior resident? Any one of the guys? Just raise the hand. Anyone here, Shabab? Abdurrahim. Unmute your microphone. Okay. So yes, uh, there is there is a retreating object. Uh, definitely, this patient will need uh, uh, surgical intervention to remove. Uh, this object inside, I mean, inside the OR. And uh, definitely we need to do a vascular study, MRV and uh, CT, CTA maybe. Yeah, so, um, yeah, but by the time this patient arrived to the ER, his, you know, both people were fixed and dilated. Um, uh, I mean, that's not the real story, but I mean, you want to know the uh, more details about the patient. Um, um, so, um, this patient, the GCS is 15. I'm sure you guys saw it over there. Um, he has no neurological deficit. And where do you think, based on the on those images, where do you think is, is this... Um, um, uh, nail gun is located. So uh, this is mainly it will be near to the occipital uh, occipital loop or uh, near to the dural sinuses, transfer dural sinuses or. Uh, it's going to be more specific. So we are in the, in the trickler uh, roughly, I think. Yeah, so it's, it's basically land, that, that's your transfer sign. So one, you don't really need a CT angiogram. I think CT phenogram is the right um, test you wanna do because arteries are fine here, but the problem is in the sinus. And the feet, so I'm gonna do phenus phase. Uh, one, it's basically, it's landed on the trickler. So that's your transfer sign. And that's really, so um, So basically it's landed in the turcula. Um, I mean, C2 phenogram gonna show you things better uh, and you will understand it more. Um, so you said you wanna take this patient to the OR, isn't it? Yes. So how do you wanna uh, approach this thing in the OR? Uh, so yeah, the patient can, can be in a supine position with the left turning uh, to the to the uh, opposite side uh, completely and to the opposite side and uh, yeah i mean it's it's natural it's it's okay i think prone is better position but yeah sure then Then we will start with the skin incisions. We can do U-shaped skin incision based on uh, on uh, uh, yeah. It will be uh, above above uh, the anions and it will cross the the midline. Sure. I mean, usually. And this kind of pathology, you do your midline skin incision and be sure you are above and below. Whenever you, whenever you open your skin, you're gonna get a, a good enough exposure, definitely. But it, it's okay, any skin incision to include the whole thing in your exposure. Then you have the skull. So how do you wanna do your craniotomy? So again, even in the in the craniotomy, I will I will. Uh... I think I, I need to cross again midline. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I will I will do wide exposure, uh, and I will I will I will do multiple uh, multiple pair hole to be able to dissect the dura, sure. and to protect the sinus as much as as we can. Sure. Then, so you, you your exposure should in include this superior sagittal sinus, two transfer sinus and occipital sinus if it's still there is that right yes definitely okay okay then everything is exposed um uh, i mean you you did your craniotomy um, um so you did your craniotomy but then how do you want to lift the bone flap Uh, yeah. I think after 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 the dissecting the dura, I I, I will try to make sure you know, that there is no. Uh, I dissect the the dura very well. Then before removing the, I think the bone, I, I should be ready for any venous uh, or I mean any sinus injury before removing the bone. And then okay. I will I will I will I will remove the bone while I am ready with the, all of the. So, okay, so you lift the, mo the, the bone and definitely you, you get to move the, the, um, the, the nail gun and you saw tremendous bleeding uh, coming from there. So what will be your next move? Uh, yeah, I will. I, I will pack it with the taco seal gel foam. Then I will uh, put a patty on it. Uh, with uh, some sort of a gentle compression and uh, and the suction on it. Uh, bleeding did not stop. Then I have to uh, either uh, put uh, mu muscle uh, muscle patch or uh, uh, before that I will try also a flu seal and then if it's not stopped then we can we can uh, either do uh, put a, a dural uh, a dural uh, fold on the sinuses or put a muscle patch on it. Yeah. Have you have you dealt with a um, with a bleeding from a major sinus like a hole in the superior sagittal sinus or transverse sinus or sigmoid sinus before? It's not the turcula because it's mm. any. So Major one needing uh, a, a, a muscle patch, uh, no. But I dealt with the the regular one in the in the usually we are encountering in the in the in the OR, and usually it's a stop by compression. So the the bottom line is the message is this is really high risk surgery. Okay, if if the, all the image, I mean you don't have to guess all the picture, but it's clearly it's penetrating the turcula which for the junior resident, it's draining the superior sagittal sign. Basically, it's draining everything. I mean, the majority of the, of the brain. Uh, and you have a patient with a GCH of 15. Um, and this, this surgery is definitely risky. Um, um, and always in our decision making, we balance the benefit from the surgery and the, the com comorbidities uh, associated with the surgery. Um, so uh, in this patient, we decided to just uh, leave, just cut the head of it and leave it in place. Um, um, avoid the comorbidity with uh, bowling it from the turcula. Um, if you decided to do this, you have to be well prepared and you have to know all your options. Um, 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 one, you are not really worried about controlling the bleeding. Majority of the sinus bleed can be controlled with pressure, um, with all different material you mentioned. Uh, Sometimes not, but most of the time. But you also, you get worried, you occlude and compromise the venous drainage of the patients. And that could cause venous infarction and um, and uh, neurological morbidity. 
Um, so if you decide to do it, you have to be prepared with all the material you said, uh, the option of primary clo closing the sinus or uh, supplemented with either um, um, fascia or um, dura graft uh, or whatever. Uh, but that's what we did. We left it, we cut the, uh, the head of it and we uh, left it in place. Um, basically GCS15 has no neurological deficit. So it's not always surgical options. If you have really huge comorbidities associated with, with your surgery, um, you can treat some of those patients consecutively. Um, permanently, or you will give time for thrombosis and uh, second run later? No, we left it behind forever. Um, um, by intervening, you are definitely has a higher risk of, of causing thrombosis. Um, uh, by just pulling it out, trying to stop the bleeding uh, and working around the sinus and put uh, tons of gel foam and surgery cell and then put the bone on the top. Um, so we left it behind, uh, as you can see in this picture. Um, the second um, uh, part of penetrating head, head injury is the missile penetrating head injury, uh, which can be um, small, um, board size less than 20 millimeter or a large uh, with more um, than 20 millimeter board size. Um, we divide it more in low velocity and high velocity based on above or below 300 meter per second. Uh, the high velocity uh, distribution are more risk to secondary shock waves and, and a cavitation military arena. Uh, Dr. Yahya, we have We have two questions just to uh, finish it together. Uh, question, is it sterile enough to keep it inside as it is unsterile for anybody? This is the first mm -hmm. question. The second question, rule of venous stinting in this case. Yeah, so we face a lot of gunshots with many fragments and bullets inside the brain. Like we see a patient with a bullet, you know, on the close to the brain stem or, or inside the thalamus, we don't go after this one. Yes, it has a risk of infection, um, but with covering those patients with antibiotics, um, um, I think the it's not significantly high. It's there. I mean, if it's get infected, this is completely different issue. Then you have your own rationale to do it. Um, but if you take this patient to the OR with a G615 and he came with really bad uh, deficit, um, I think that's, I mean, that will be um, a big concern, at least for me. I mean, people has different approach to things, but um, uh, risk of infection, as I said, we don't retain all fragments uh, or bullets fragments from the brain if they are deep because you are, you're gonna cause more damage than benefits. And most of the time the antibiotic will, will take care um, 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 of, the, uh, of the infection. The, uh, the second one is, is stenting. Um, um, I, I'm not sure you mean stenting and leaving this in place or taking it or doing a stenting after. Not sure, Sarahat, and what he mean by the question. But the question, any rule for venous stenting? Yeah, I mean, I mean, arterial stenting is wide common. We, we, I mean, we see it in aneurysm cases. Um, I haven't seen either my in my residency in, or in my fellowship anyone put a stent in the venous system. It might be has a rule, but it, it's not in this one. And for how long you will keep the antibiotic, Doctor? Uh, Yes, so as I said, there is really good, no good um, uh, guidelines for how long. Um, usually, as I said, if, if there are high risk patients, I, I, cover, I, I do broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, usually it's uh, from 10 to 14 days. Um, this number is 
I don't have any evidence to support that, but, but from 10 to 14 days. Okay, yeah, take it out here. So again, I mean, it's a, it's a controversial case, but I mean, the, the message from this case is always consider what's the morbidities and what harm you can do for this patient by doing your intervention uh, and outweigh it with the benefits. Um, um, as you all know, the gunshot injury has a higher risk of mortality and it's most lethal type. Unfortunately, two thirds die at the scene and half of the survivor will die uh, in the first day. Uh, overall mortality is reported to be 90 uh, percent, but I found it a bit high. Um, at, at a, I mean, we don't have really a good epidemiological study looked at the gunshot um, uh, injury, but I have seen many survivors in the, in the last two years with very bad gunshot injuries. Uh, we found GCS at presentation is the mo major detrimental for long-term outcome. And always I emphasize my, my resident and specialist to uh, stop sedation, get proper GCS, um, because some, them, some patients, they will present with really poor neurological examinations. And because just because of that, we, we um, decline the surgical intervention, although if it does look indicated on the CT scan. So those are the factors which could, which usually associated with, um, with um, higher mortality is the high velocity gunshot, multi uh, lower injuries, uh, as well as bihemispheric injury. Uh, if you have a significant ventricular bleed, and low GCS on a rifle. So this patient presented with uh, um, uh, a severe um, penetrating injury. Um, the entry was left right occipital. It's crossing to the right sylvian fissure, uh, as you can see. Um, uh, I did not document his GCS when he came in. Uh, but definitely, um, uh, this patient should have reasonable, uh, at least motor response when they came, when he came. Um, that's why we did um, uh, intervene. Um, when you look at the CT scan, um, your goal of surgery, I, I mean, sorry, I, I, I bought the uh, post-op CT scan, but when you look at that CT scan, you have the bullet, you have fragments at the entry point, which is left right occipital, as you can see on the, um, my left hand side. Um, we have, uh, um, and then you have the bullet landed um, close to the sylvian fissure. Uh, so your goal of surgery here is not really, you can do debridement and clean here outside, uh, if it's big, but it's not to go after the bullet. Um, your goal here is, um, apart from doing debridement to the entrance point, is uh, to evacuate the hematoma. To really feel, because you can see on the CT scan, patient has significant has subdural hematoma, intracerebral hematoma on the on the right hemisphere with a midline shift. So your goal is to evacuate the subdural hematoma and do decompressive craniotomy. And we are not trying to retain any one of those fragments as you can see in the post-op, all those fragments are inside. Um, so the goal of surgery again is either, and this is just an example of dealing with hematoma and edema, um, secondary uh, to the injury um, uh, by doing decompressive craniectomy and evacuating the, uh, the hematoma uh, uh, on top of uh, doing debridement. Uh, he had a reasonable outcome, surprisingly. I was really surprised with this patient. Um, this is an example of a follow-up angiogram. So, so even if you had a, a negative 
um, um, uh, or suspicion on the CT angiogram, always we recommend to do DSA and usually within, I mean, sometimes we do it three weeks or four, four weeks after to look uh, for uh, pseudo aneurysm, uh, as you can see on this, uh, on this angiogram. So this is um, um, a 29 years old male soldier patient uh, arrived at midnight, um, presented with decreasing level of consciousness. He was intubated, but hemodynamically stable on a small dose of fentanyl. And this is his GCS. Um, let us get one of the maybe senior guys to or hofer or any volunteer. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, have an uh, examination of this patient to look for the GCS. Uh, and uh, for this patient, uh, as I can see that GCS is seven, uh, I would like to uh, make sure that the patient is stabilized hemodynamically and he's hemodynamically stabilized according to the lecture. So I would like to get a CT scan for this patient just to look uh, for uh, the trajectory. Uh, and the pathway of the missile. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, obviously, this this, uh, this soldier just uh, had a uh, missile uh, penetrating brain injury. So, I would like to get the CT scan so I can assist the patient. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't find his CT scan. But if you allow me, I'll just describe it for you. I know it's hard, okay. but uh, I, I just I found it really interesting case. So, um, so the bullet. Um, um, uh, as you can see, uh, basically it, it went through the um, sp spinous process of C2, then um, um, penetrated the just above the foramen magnum, and um, and landed beside the medulla, um, and landed there. No significant hematoma I could see uh, on the mm. CT scan. As you all know, you get some artifact around the, the bullet, but there was no, the tonsil looks in a normal position and there is no significant hematoma or, or, or crowdness. And that's what I usually emphasize. Uh, in the you should look at. Um, yes, that's the big Okay, so uh, uh, first of all, uh, we, 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 uh, according to the GCS, we can g uh, give this patient a chance. Uh, we, we should look for a full neurological examination, including the pupils, and also just to look if there is any uh, signs of herniation, any quality of the pupils. So we uh, take the patient to the OR uh, in an emergency situation. I think this patient, uh, we can uh, put the patient in a prone position we starting Why? by. Yeah. Huh? So, Ahmed, always, always ask yourself why you are doing the surgery. So, what's your education? What's are you planning okay. to do? Actually, uh, yani, uh, this patient, yani, there is no uh, yani, the, the, the factors that uh, increase the uh, morbidity for this patient. And yani, this patient, actually, the missile is not penetrating midlines and it's not causing severe hematoma. And uh, I, yes, this patient has a severe head injury, according to the GCS. Although any, there is no uh, factors that increase in mortality and morbidity according to the trajectory of the pathway. Uh, the site maybe is dangerous because it's in the posterior fossa, and this patient can had uh, hydrocephalus easily from the brain edema uh, or uh, from a small hemorrhage around and can cause obstructive hydrocephalus. But uh, I, I think this patient can yeah, had a chance. Uh, he's young and uh, he's hemodynamically stable. You see, Steven, I think he can have a chance. So, so again, why you are doing the surgery? Just in one second. Okay. Uh, so let us summarize our topic in general. Okay. Why do we usually interfere? Um, um, like what do we usually do in those patients? Like why do you do your surgery? One is for debridement. Mm. Okay, so that's one of the indications. 
uh, uh, I mean, deployment, you can do this one. I mean, in the OR, but even you can do it in the ER. Um, yeah. But what was uh, your indication for surgery? Uh, indication for surgery, I mean, this patient actually could have any uh, easily, uh, any can develop a brain edema, especially that. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, I just uh, la, 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 this uh, sorry, uh, this uh, the bullet and the missile is landed in the middle, so the brain stem maybe he's affected, but yeah, 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 we can have the examination if the brain stem is severely injured, and I think this patient should have have the examination of GCS three and fixed and dilated pupil rather than GCS seven with them uh, with uh, sluggish and equal pupil. So I think any. Yeah, yeah, this patient can, uh, we can do a posterior fossil decompression for this patient because I think this patient is salvageable. Yeah, so uh, again, you do it your deployment, I mean, or you do it for high ICB, isn't it, for hematoma, uh, midline shift. Uh, so this patient doesn't have significant hematoma, doesn't have midline shift, doesn't have hydro uh, on the CT scan. The sinus is not involved. Uh, so there is no role in MRI in a gunshot for mm. um, for asking. You know, there is a bullet inside. We don't do, and it doesn't really add anything. So, um, uh, so the CTA for the vertebral artery. Yeah. So excellent. CT angiogram is really uh, important. Definitely, uh, the tract of this. A bullet in the in the neighborhood of um, vertebral artery, uh, so definitely should be done. Um, uh, deterioration could be due to stroke, not the bullet. Yeah. So um, usually in those patients, we treat uh, we because someone said um, bullet removal. We don't really go after a bullet if it's deep in the brain. I think I'm I'm trying to emphasize that that point. We don't go after a bullet if it's a deep in the brain. If it's really deep and beside the brain is medulla, uh, you don't go and try to uh, take it out. Um, we do it if it's causing hematoma, if it's causing mass effect, um, uh, then you go after it. Uh, so patients still, uh, I mean, if you look at his neurological assessment, it's actually not bad. So he is his motor is five, and his eye opening is two, but he's in some small dose of fentanyl. So that's why, and I think it's really critical for the junior, whenever, usually, I, I mean, I trust the motor response because always the patients, I mean, in, in trauma in general, patients sometimes is in shock. Sometimes, I mean, it's, there's a residual sedation uh, from the transport. Um, so always, um, I consider the motor response, and again, and emphasize to stop all the sedation. So his neurological exam was actually not bad. So anyway, this patient at the beginning was treated conservatively, uh, and um, uh, I did not argue with that. Um, uh, uh, bullet this side can cause a spinous ligament injury. Um, um, I mean, it, I mean, the trajectory is not going through any major uh, ligament. Um, um, uh, but I think the most important things uh, you should ask your junior is if the patient has a problem with uh, heart rate or if the patient's had a problem with blood pressure or with respiratory. Um, um, because so this patient doesn't have, uh, and I I'm I I'm, you, I'm not disagree with surgery. I think it's a it's a reasonable option. You can do it, and but your indication you should you should say it clearly. I'm worried this bullet is in the foramen magnum. It's by the medulla, and there is a little bit of hematoma. At at any point. Um, this patient has a, a very high risk for herniation and death, especially if he's ventilated. So if you said that, then I'm totally agree. And I think it's a reasonable option 
uh, to take this patient to the operating room. Um, so he came in middle of the night. They claim his heart rate was completely fine. His blood pressure is fine. There's no instability. Was treated con conservatively in next morning. I mean, they, they got called his heart rate fluctuating 35 to 60. Um, so then, I mean, you should start to be concerned. Um, and I'm, I'm really not against surgical intervention. I think it's completely reasonable, but your indi indication should be clear is considering the locations and those patients could deteriorate very fast. And, um, uh, and the, by the time the neurosurgery team get involved, it will be too late. Um, so that's, it should be your, your indication. Uh, so we took him back, we took him into the OR. Uh, basically we did, um, uh, even without repeating the CT scan, because we know uh, what's the problem. Uh, and those patients usually, it's not necessarily their levels of consciousness will change, but if the bullet just, you know, uh, by the medulla and little bit of bleeding there, that should be enough to cause cardiac, I mean, heart rate irregularity and blood pressure problem. Uh, so we took a C1 as, as if you are doing uh, Chiari decompression, uh, open, uh, we opened the dura wide. Uh, there was a hematoma around the, uh, the fragment, uh, which I, I believe it's new because it wasn't there. Uh, fragment and bullet was removed as well as the hematoma uh, and he did uh, have really good recovery. Um, so the the message from this case is I, I, you have to be certain about your indications. Not all bullets should be retained. Uh, if it's causing problem, um, definitely yes. Um, uh, causing hematoma, mass effect, you are really worried about the location of the bullet, um, then you can go after it and remove it. Uh, is there a question around this case or? If you want, Doctor, we can move on with the cases and we back okay. to the question. So last thing is, is bone blast injury. It's, it's really not different from um, um, other penetrating head injuries we have to do. Uh, the indication are, are the same. Uh, you have to do your wide craniotomy um, and um, the indication also it's, it's the same. And this is just um, an example of, uh, of one patient we had recently. Um, I don't know what's happening here. So your home message. Um, uh, penetratic brain injury is definitely less common than blunt traumatic brain injury. Um, overall management is more or less the same. Um, you have to do your um, good history as well as the uh, proper neurological exa examination and documentation of the GCS. Uh, you have to do your proper uh, images. Um, vascular injury is common on those patients. You have to, so, so you have to investigate that. Um, you have, I mean, all the medical management of traumatic brain injury definitely does apply in penetrating head injury in, treat, in, in term of um, head position, uh, role of manitol, no role of sedation, role of ICB monitoring, it's more or less the same. Um, um, we have um, a degree of damage to depend on variety of factors, uh, which we did mention. Uh, Non-missile low velocity projectile is uncommon, um, but usually they have a really good prognosis. Uh, unfortunately, missile has a very high velocity, uh, uh, are more common and often has a, a poor prognosis. Um, you have to know the infection and seizure is more, more common uh, among the survivor uh, uh, in those patients. Uh, I, I do emphasize on, on your uh, indications um, and you have to uh, weight your benefit and and and, uh, and risk of your procedure. Um, we the main goal is deployment. Uh, better to be done in the OR. Um, uh, you target uh, uh, hematoma causing mass effect, uh, decompressive craniectomy for significant unilateral, um, hopeful case. Um, um, if it's very superficial fragment. Uh, yes, we, we take it. If it's really deep in the brain, we don't really go after it. 
Okay, so that's that's really the uh, the the home message. Uh, I will leave. Um, uh, thank you guys for listening, and uh, I'm really open for your question. Uh, we have already a couple of questions here. Uh, we start with the, uh, if we decide to leave the foreign body inside, any rule for anticoagulants? Uh, yes. So the role of anticoagulation is is definitely the same as the traumatic brain injury patients. Um, usually. In both of day one or two, um, if the patient um, doesn't have significant huge hematoma, um, you are not suspecting um, a vascular injury, and the patient um, is not mobilized like severe head injury, we usually start them on DTT prophylaxis. You do full up CT scan, you want to be sure the hematoma is stable, uh, or yeah. I mean, usually it's a small hematoma, it's stable, then you start your anticoagulation. I mean, it's always risk benefit. We have many patients who we delayed and they died from PE, so. Uh, question, uh, if there is a, a case when we don't have initial Glasgow coma scale and we receive the patient sedated due to the transfer from far away, uh, in such situations, sometimes it's unsafe to stop the sedation. Do we operate to exoblore or we should wait and observe? Yeah, so, I mean, trauma in general and specifically in penetrated head injury, there is no rules. I mean, there is no golden rules you have to follow. I mean, at the end, you have to follow your clinical judgment. Um, in penetrating head injury, Usually, it's um, your usually the lung is fine. I mean, usually, so we get scared. We don't want to stop sedation if the patient has a um, problem with ventilation. Okay, in, in penetrating head injury, usually that's not an issue. Uh, if you have a traumatic brain injury and patient has really bad lung, uh, and you cannot stop, I mean, stop the sedation uh, to assist that patient clinically, I think this patient overall clinical condition is critical enough. I believe even he will not benefit from any surgery, but uh, uh, I mean, there's some time we cannot stop sedation, yes, but not in penetrating any injury. And we always hear that statement, patient is unstable from ER physician, from the ICU physician, or we cannot mobilize the patient to the CT scan because he's hemodynamically unstable. But at the end, you cannot just wait until the patient dies. So you, usually you intervene, you try to correct the patient hemodynamics as well as the respiratory function and proceed either with your clinical assessment with, the, with images and make a decision. Um, um, the other reason you get really worried um, about stopping sedation is from high ICB. Um, um, and, uh, and, and those patients, I mean, those are really rare scenarios. But there are a couple of things could help you in your decision making. One is the age of the patient. What are the comorbidities of those patients? Uh, what kind of finding you are? I mean, you. I mean, a couple of things in the history you could ask the referring physician. What was the initial VCS? What was the patient doing before intubation? If he said the patient came flat to the ER. I mean, he's, he could be in shock, but I mean, it's still, that's really critical and important. If he said the patient was localizing before the intubation, then I will take that one as a really a good salvageable patient if he has a pathology and you need to deal with it. A um, couple of things that help you on the CT scan, as I said, if the pathology is unilateral, those patients will benefit, uh, especially if it's the right hemisphere. Um, I mean, and, and then you look at the brain as a whole. Some patients, they came with a severe brain edema. You don't see any such sign uh, in both hemisphere. Um, and usually th those patients get sinus injuries. Uh, and you know definitely those patients are not gonna get benefit either with surgery. But I have a couple of questions. I will just join them as one question because it's the same topic. Do you continue uh, CTR prophylaxis beyond seven days? Uh, if no seizure occurred. And the other question was, uh, if it's cross cortex, do we give anti-epileptic medication? 
No, I give all those patients anti-seizure medication for one week. Okay. Do you leave the bullet fragment inside the ventricles? Sorry, do you? Do you leave the bullet fragments inside the ventricles? Yeah, I don't remove them. No. Okay. Um, and, and I think one is, uh, I mean, I, I did not come across a patient with a just bullet uh, just lying on the ventricle. I mean, that's really easy to remove. You can get the endoscope and remove it. But always the bullet, if it's passing the midline, usually it, it does land on the contralateral side. I have seen really many, I mean, definitely, definitely more than 50 cases of penetrating injury. I haven't seen any patient with a bullet just landed in the ventricle. Okay, always, if they're gonna pass the, that hemisphere, they landed in the contralateral hemisphere. And as you all know, once the bullet passed the, the midline and passed the ventricle, usually those patients have really poor GCs when they come. Um, they have really diffuse bad brain edema and they don't have really a good recovery. Uh, any advice about managing CSF leak from penetrating head injury? Um, try your best. Um, um, I come across only one case of, uh, of CSF leak. It was a, a soldier who has a bullet, um, went through his um, uh, uh, the entry point was retroauricular and landed in the brain, but basically destroyed everything. Um, at, um, uh, if in um, transverse sigmoid sinus was completely uh, injured on that side, um, all pitreous bone is gone, all skull, skull base dura is gone. Uh, so in those patients, uh, so if you have uh, injury like this, um, uh, usually I, um, uh, I put a lumbar drain on those patients um, after the um, uh, full deployment. Um, I mean, always it's easy um, to close the dura primary and always we don't have a leak through the skin or through your closure. Always the leak is through the ear uh, or through the nose. Um, so if you have, I mean, you try your best. Um, um, to find where is that defect. Um, uh, sometime you dissect the dura from the skull base. So we will conclude the uh, webinar today.